Hi everyone, and welcome to the Family Matters interview series. Thank you for choosing to join the presentation tonight. We are so happy to have you here with us. Um, a few reminders that all lines will be muted throughout the presentation. So please enter any of your questions into the chat box and someone from the BCAT team will respond to you in two to three business days. We are pleased to have Lynn Young joining us tonight to answer the question, how do I best communicate with mom? Lynn is the Director of Strategic Integration for Mansbach Health Tools, and she has been a speech language pathologist for 30 years. Working in a variety of acute and post-acute settings, she has worked with adult and geriatric patients with a variety of neurological conditions, including dementia. She currently serves as a member of the Professional Development Committee for the American Speech, Language, and Hearing Association Special Interest Group in Gerontology. And joining Lynn is Aaron Kneffel, the Vice President of Strategic Integration at Mansbach Health Tools. Lynn and Aaron, I will turn it over to you. Hi everyone, welcome to the Family Matters Educational Series. My name is Erin Kneffel, and I'm joined today by our subject matter expert, speech language pathologist, Lynn Young. In today's session, entitled, How Do I Best Communicate with Mom? You'll learn why and how communication changes with aging, and then you'll also learn some tips and strategies to continue to communicate and, and, and engage with your loved ones. Welcome to the session, Lynn. Hi, thank you so much for having me. Can you tell the audience about your professional background and what, what you're currently working on? Sure. Um, I've been a speech language pathologist for a little over 30 years. I've spent the majority of that time working with adults and older adults in a multitude of settings, everything from um, inpatient, you know, acute care hospitals, in skilled nursing centers, home health, outpatients, so really um, across the board. And I'm currently um, an employee of Mansbach Health Tools. Great, excellent. Well, again, we're so happy that you can join us today. Thank you. Um, so we're all on the same page. Can you explain to the audience the different ways we communicate with one another besides talking? Sure. I mean, when we think about communication, we're really thinking about how do we send and receive a message? So when we think about both sides of that, there's both the expressive side, right, where we're the one presenting information, and then there's the receptive side where we're receiving back information. So we can do that in a couple of different ways. When we're sharing information, we can do that verbally, right? We can express an idea or a thought to somebody um, out loud in a conversation, or we can do that with the written word. So writing would also be a form of expressive communication. When we think about receptive communication, we're thinking about listening, right? Being in a conversation, taking in information from someone else, but we may also be doing that through reading comprehension. So there's multiple ways we can send and receive information through communication. There's also nonverbal communication, which I think we often forget about. And sometimes we are conveying something through nonverbal communication. And sometimes we're seeing nonverbal communication from the partner that we're speaking with. So an example of nonverbal communication would be um, if you think about um, a smile or the shrug of a shoulder, an eye roll, right? Those are all nonverbal communications. And we message information that way when we're talking to others. And we can also sometimes pick up on um, underlying meaning and um, other people's messaging by looking at their nonverbal communication. So I always consider the nonverbal piece as well. Great, excellent. Um, tell me if you can explain to the audience, how does the aging process impact or change someone's ability to communication? Um, and then if possible, like what are what are the key stages and characteristics of individuals who have dementia as opposed to maybe those without that that condition? Sure. So when we think about um, older adults, we have a variety of folks on, on a continuum. So and there's no hard line between some of these stages. Sometimes people have characteristics of one stage and the next. 
But we might think about it this way. There are people that are exhibiting just normal aging, you know, changes that come with just getting a little bit older. There are folks that might have what we call mild cognitive impairment. And then there are people that may have a, a diagnosis of dementia and maybe exhibiting symptoms um, along that dementia process. So let's talk about all three. Normal aging, we would expect to see um, just some intermittent word finding difficulty. So every once in a while, people struggle to come up with that target word, whether it's the name of a place they've been or a restaurant or, or whatnot. Um, it may just take them a little bit of extra time to come up with um, something that they want to say. And, and they often are very successful if you can give them a cue or a hint of some kind. So if you say, you know, what letter, what's the first letter? Once they can get that first letter, sometimes they can get the whole um, target word. So with normal aging, we just see some very mild changes and we may see a little bit of a slowdown in processing. So when they're listening, it may be just slightly slower um, when they're processing information, particularly information that's lengthy or complex. It's a little bit different when we think about people um, that are exhibiting mild cognitive impairment. So with mild cognitive impairment, those expressive issues, they become more frequent and they become um, more noticeable. So we start to see more issues with word finding, that difficulty coming up with the right word. We may also notice that um, our conversational partner is having trouble with the topic, staying on the topic, right? Being able to go back and forth in an exchange about the same topic, um, or they may be having difficulty shifting topics. So you've had a conversation about the holidays and then you're shifting over to switch to a new topic. Maybe now you're talking about um, a birthday that's coming up and they're still kind of stuck talking about that holiday information. They're having a hard time kind of shifting gears. We may also see some distractibility. So it becomes a little more difficult to maintain and sustain attention. So we want to make sure that our conversations are happening in an environment that supports the communication. So being thoughtful about you know, environmental distraction. When we move into the dementia, continuum. Again, it's a continuum. So we may have folks that are mild, moderate, all the way through to severe or more advanced dementia. When we think about those folks that are in that middle, that moderate category, the problems start to really become more pervasive. So we start to see the verbal expression kind of shorten. So instead of speaking in full sentences, they may be using phrases and they may start to repeat things more frequently than they did before. Um, they may also need um, shorter information auditorily to be successful. So if, they're, if you're asking them to follow a direction, it may be more successful if it's a one or two step direction instead of a two or three step direction. And then as we look at um, some of those folks who are presenting with more advanced dementia, there may be really limited verbal output at that time. They may be just using single words or they may be relying mostly on nonverbal expression. So to facilitate communication with these types of folks, we really want to make sure that we are um, you know, at eye level with them and using all of the senses to really help support our conversational exchanges. So by using touch, you know, connecting with someone physically, shortening our expressions, making sure we slow down our speech rate and very much simplify our language, we can have some communications with these types of folks, also limiting that environmental distractibility, those noises and the environment will help. But also it's always really important to just be thinking about and mindful of hearing is one of the last senses to really go. So, you know, I've seen a lot of communication exchanges where maybe a staff member and a family member are talking about an older adult with dementia while that person is present. And they may not always be saying things that are complimentary. So keep in mind, they may still be able to understand more than they can show. So, you know, talking in front of that person, they may be able to pick out keywords that things are that are said, being said. So just always thinking about that. And then really looking at their nonverbals. Um, sometimes these types of folks will 
be able to communicate through a nonverbal what they can't say. So they may be, for example, um, groaning or rocking um, or holding a body part if they're in pain, but they may not be able to come right out and say, my hip is hurting, can I have a pain medication? So we have to really tune into those nonverbal communications and kind of meet them where they are so that we can have successful communications with these types of folks. That's excellent. And, and lots of key points. Um, I think for, for all of us who know individuals, aging adults with um, dementia, those are really great tips and strategies. But um, do you think that you could give us or share with us some maybe more broader based tips or, or strategies that we could use with anybody um, who's demonstrating cognitive and or cognitive communication decline, just to make sure that there is that ongoing connection and meaningful engagement with our loved ones? Sure, sure. We talked a little bit about um, background noise or distraction, and that's always a good thing to be thoughtful about. If we can have our conversations in the most quiet place possible, avoid any background noise that could be, you know, conversations that are happening nearby, it could be music or the television, that tends to be very distracting um, for older adults across the spectrum, but particularly for um, people with dementia. So we don't want them to have to work really hard to pay attention to the conversation. We want them to be a participant and enjoy and be able to you know, generate their own answers. So we wanna take away that um, extra level of difficulty where they're having to kind of tune out what they're hearing while simultaneously attending to the conversation. Um, I think another few things to think about is how we speak and what we kind of lead with. So we want to speak at a normal pace. You know, we don't want to slow down. I think sometimes people think that if I slow down my speech rate, that will simplify things for the listener. I'll talk really slowly and that will be helpful to them. But it, it often is less effective. And the reason for that is people with dementia have deficits or difficulty with holding on to information. We call it working memory. So they only have maybe just a few seconds of that temporary storage to take in what you're saying, to process it, and then to be able to respond to it. So if we go too slow, they may actually forget what the topic was or what you were asking of them before they can even comprehend it and respond back. So just speak at a normal pace as you normally would. And then lead with your main point. I think this is always a good one to remember. You know, we, we don't want to make the listener wait for sort of the meat and potatoes of the message. We want to put that out at the beginning. So try to begin your communication with the main point. Um, that way, again, that working memory, their ability to process and understand what we're asking them to do, they're getting it right out of the gate. So for example, if we wanted someone to come over to the table and eat dinner with us, we would lead with, let's sit here, it's dinner time, as opposed to saying something like, hey, I want you to come on over. We're going to be having meatloaf for dinner tonight. I know you love meatloaf. Can you take a seat? So we really want to lead with that direction. And hopefully that will help that person understand you know, what we want them to do, which is have a seat right out of the gate, as opposed to kind of burying it in the back of the message. And then when we speak to these folks, make sure we're using very short, direct kinds of statements. Um, avoid things that are abstract language. And what I mean by that is, flowery things, metaphors, um, anything that might be confusing to them, even sometimes sarcasm, humor, um, or a lot of pronouns can be confusing. So we really want to just be as direct as we can and make it simple. When we think about how we convey information, match up what we're what we're saying with our body language. So if we're saying come sit down, we might, you know, do a gesture, come over here, point to the chair, tap the chair, you know, you're going to sit here, we're giving them some extra information to help with their processing. And it also matches the verbal, right, that we're giving. So we want to convey that information in a way that matches the verbal with the nonverbal. And be thinking about your body language. You know, sometimes if we're frazzled, if we're hurried, 
if we're anxious, if we have a lot to get done, that comes across. So we don't want to convey, you know, stressed, talk loudly, talk really fast. That may start to create more anxiety or, or agitation in the person that we're talking to. So think about the way that you want to convey your information, but also how you do it. So maybe you're smiling, you're presenting, you know, a very relaxed demeanor, your body language is relaxed. We want that person to stay relaxed and connected. So just some things to think about um, as we're talking to uh, persons with dementia. And then I can't stress enough to really make sure you're mirroring the, the person that you're speaking with. So if they're standing up, you wanna be standing up and at eye level. If they're sitting down, you wanna be sitting across from them. You don't wanna be standing over someone while they're sitting, you wanna be right there at eye level. And then face to face, you know, make sure you're not distracted, you're not trying to do other things while you're conveying a message. Connect to that person, say their name first. You know, maybe even touch them on the sleeve or touch, touch their hand. Make sure they're looking at you to make sure they're hearing what you're saying and that they're able to pay attention. And then always kind of spot check. Is what I'm saying getting through? Are they understanding what I mean? Or do I need to say it a different way? Am I saying too much at once? Do I need to shorten it? You know, so you can often tell when you give a direction if they don't complete it or they don't go to initiate it. The, the message is probably getting lost somewhere. So, you know, make sure you're kind of checking in with yourself. Did I give too much information or what I gave was it maybe too complicated? Should I have given it in a different way? So sometimes using those techniques will be really helpful in making sure that our messages are successful and that we're setting up our conversational partner for success to be able to understand what we said and then, you know, create the response. That's excellent. Thank you so much. It sounds like very practical ways that we could can practice the way that we're engaging with our loved ones. So thank you for that. Um, beyond the tips and strategies, are there any particular activities or exercises that family members can use with their loved ones to remain connected, um, especially for those individuals maybe with more advanced um, cognitive impairments, maybe mild, moderate uh, stages of dementia? What do you think? Sure. You know, I think you bring up a really good point, Erin, in that people with dementia can't seek engagement like other people can, right? If we want to engage with someone, if we're bored, if we're lonely, if we're sad, we can call a family member, we can call a friend, we can reach out and connect with someone. They often don't have the ability to do that. So we need to sort of bring the engagement activity to them. And by having something that's meaningful, that's personally relevant, that's something they enjoy, um, that will really increase their engagement and participation. So I want to be thinking about what can I bring to, you know, my time with my loved one that would be something engaging, fun, interactive that I know they'd like to participate in that is a shared activity that we're both doing it together. And one thing that comes to mind that I think would be a really great tool for family members is our Mempix books. Um, Mempix books are um, books that contain multiple activities. They have six chapters within each, each of the books. And each of those activities has a picture, fun facts, prompting questions, and a story about a variety of topics. So finding the right book would be the first step. So books on music, books on um, animals or sports, whatever topic they're interested in, we would use one of these Mempix books to really stimulate um, old memories by talking about familiar places, people, events, um, objects, things that are relatable to older adults. So maybe they love Elvis and maybe doing um, one of these little chapters on Elvis, looking at the picture, discussing, you know, what? tell me about a time in your life where you were a fan of Elvis. Did you ever see Elvis in person? What are your favorite songs? Really get some conversation going. And then if it stalls out a little bit or you're looking for other things to discuss, you have those fun facts you can share and some questions you can pose to your family member to get the conversation back up and running. And then the stories are really great 
um, the stories can be read out loud, right? You can, you can each have a book in your hands. You can go back and forth. They can read the first few sentences. You can talk about it. You might read a few sentences, discuss again. And then you can also pull in other family members. So they work really well um, remotely too. So if you had a grandchild that really enjoys hearing a story before bed, you might be able to set up, you know, grandma with one book and the grandchild with the other. And the grandchild could read to grandma or grandma could read to the grandchild straight out of the book and have a really nice and, you know, engaging interaction together that's beneficial to both that they're really going to enjoy. So I think thinking outside the box and having shared activities where both people are doing something, but they're doing it together can really help. We want to make sure that the person with dementia has something in their hands, something they can look at, they can turn the pages um, to really help them stay focused on the task and stay engaged. That's ex that's excellent. Um, one one question for you. Um, you mentioned the phone or you know getting on a phone with a, a grandchild. You know we've got so many um, family members who are separated, right? Whether it was during COVID, during social distancing, or whether it's a matter of you know your loved ones live in a different state. How are or what are some ways that um, you know, could still stay connected and engage with your loved one um, when you're not in the same physical location? Like, is it okay to use Zoom or FaceTime with your loved one who has dementia? What are your thoughts on that? Absolutely. I mean, you may need somebody on one end to help facilitate the setup right? Because there might be a, a multiple steps to getting onto the FaceTime or getting onto the Zoom. So if, if they can have a caregiver or another family member, you know, with them next to them to help them get up and running, once they're on there, you know, you can have any kind of interaction that you'd like to. You could share a meal together over FaceTime. You're on one end eating dinner, they're on their end eating dinner, and you're just enjoying, you know, sharing a meal like you always did. You could Again, use something like your Mempix books and have directed conversation, looking at pictures, talking about different times in their life, you know, pulling from old memories um, and engaging that way. You can you can do multiple things through FaceTime that, you know, you you can pull up um, other images in Zoom, right? So if you're in Zoom, you can share an image. If you're talking about Elvis, you might want to listen to a song together, or you might want to pull up an actual picture of an Elvis concert, right? Just to make it more engaging, more interactive. So there's lots of ways we can leverage technology. A couple of things to be thinking about. Um, lots of older adults have hearing impairment and or vision impairment. So you do want to make sure that they can hear okay and see the screen appropriately. Um, those might be some barriers just to be thinking about with setup. But again, once they're up and running, and if they have um, a shared activity, so if they have something in their hand and you have something in your hand, they can they can just go. They can look at what they're looking at on their side, and you two can converse and engage and 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 talk about old times and and fun things in the past, and and even current events if you want together. So, I um, mean, you know, the sky's the limit with technology. It really does open up that door, especially as we're mindful of COVID sort of waxing and waning and, you know, social distancing, it's always a great backup to personal interactions if we can take advantage of it. Great. Um, just one follow-up question to that. I know you mentioned the Mempix book. They sound like a, a great um, opportunity for engaging. You know, many adults have um, photos of family members in their apartments. So let's say, you know, I call up my mom who's in a senior living apartment and she starts talking about some photos, but she can't think of the name. Um, do you recommend using family photos to have conversations and engagement, or does it make more sense to use something that's more, I don't know, objective or unrelated to families? What do you think about that? I mean, sometimes people will really want to talk about a specific photo. I mean, I always recommend if family members are going to leave photos to label the back of the photo. So if someone is on the end with a family member supporting that interaction, that FaceTime call, they have a sense of you know, what that picture represents. But it can sometimes lead to more confusion because 
they're really desperately trying to remember somebody's name or a location where the photo was taken, a certain beach that they were at or a certain vacation that they went on. And sometimes it can create more frustration and anxiety for the person with dementia because they can't convey to you, especially over the phone, what they're trying to express. So remember, they have word finding deficits, so they may not be able to come up with the right words. So they may not be describing it in as much detail as they think they are, and it can become a guessing game where you're on the other end just trying to guess, you know, is it this picture? Is it that picture? Is it dad? Is it grandpa? Is it Uncle Joe? And they're getting frustrated and, and you're getting frustrated. So, you know, having something like the Mempix books takes all that guesswork right out of it. And now you have the actual picture in front of you and the actual picture in front of them. And you can talk about it in detail and you're sure that you're looking at the same exact thing. So, you know, there's pros and cons to the family pictures, but they do sometimes create more frustration in those middle and later stages of dementia because their word finding and their ability to label things becomes so impaired that they may not be able to convey to you what, what picture they actually are looking at. Does that make sense? It does. Yes. Thank you so much. I just wanted to clarify that. I know oftentimes our family members you know, want to re-engage with old photos thinking they're pulling from stored memories. But to your point, if the if the resident can't pull up the names of the people in the photos, it, it can be very frustrating to them. But you've given us so much information tonight and lots of takeaways that, you know, individuals can use to really ensure that there are great opportunities for engaging with their loved ones, whether they're physically in the same location or whether they're over the telephone or some other type of platform. So, Thanks again for joining us tonight, Lynn, and, and thanks everybody on the, on the other end for participating in the Family Matters series today. Bye-bye. Of course. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much, Lynn and Erin. Uh, like you said, Erin, that was really great information. Uh, we would like to take this opportunity to invite you all to become a member of the Enrich Brain Health Program by signing up on our Enrich website. And if you're interested in more information from the BCAT Research Center, you can follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn. And I'll go ahead and put those links up on the screen for you. Um, if you have any questions, you can type them into the chat box and a member of the BCAT team will respond to you in two to three business days. Thank you all so much for joining this episode of the Family Matters series, and we hope to see you again for our next episode in October entitled, How Do You Know When It Is Time for Assisted Living? I will stay in the meeting for a few extra minutes in case anybody has any questions, and otherwise, I hope you have a great evening.